get started. It is 7 o'clock, so as people come in, we'll just let them get settled in, but we are going to get going because we have lots of great candidates to hear from tonight. I want to welcome everyone. My name is Sheila Barner, and I'm a member of the Meet the Candidates Committee here in Montrose. And uh, before we begin, if I could just ask everyone to turn their cell phones to silent or vibrate, turn them off, so it doesn't interrupt um, any of the candidates while they're you know, answering their questions. So our candidates this evening were invited to participate totally on a volunteer basis, so I want to thank them all for coming and participating tonight. We did have one candidate, Jill, who had a family emergency. She apologizes. She wasn't able to come at the very last minute. Um, but we're going to go ahead with what we've got. Now, do we believe that the Meet the Candidates event is an effective way to engage our community and demonstrate the value of our city council roles? This event allows concerned voters an opportunity to meet and become better informed about the candidates we have for our city council and for our mayor position. And it also allows candidates to express their views openly so audience members can better understand their positions and make informed voting choice choices. The format for this evening is going to be led by a moderator, myself, and it will also have a timer, which will be Lori, and each candidate will give, be given a two-minute time to respond to questions that they were given ahead of time at, before the event. So we're going to start out with introductions of the candidates. They'll each be able to give an opening statement, two minutes. They'll be, and we'll be going through the predetermined questions. Each candidate has received a card that they drew at random, and so we will be drawing at random the order that they will answer the questions. Then we are going to be answering three random audience questions from the fishbowl. If you've got a question that you want to hear answered, go ahead and fill it out, drop it into the bowl. We're going, to, we're going to draw for three random ones at the end of the event. We're going to have closing statements, and then there's going to be an open meet and greet with the audience. So before we begin, um, just to let you know, the candidates were given four questions ahead of time to prepare a response for. They're going to be able to have two minutes to respond, and then one minute for any questions that myself as a moderator might need to clarify. Turn my page. And um, at the beginning, sorry, at the beginning of the event, the audience members are going to be able to submit written questions. We're going to draw for three, like I said before. And then at the conclusion of the event, each applicant will have two minutes to have your um, closing comments. So we're going to get started tonight. All right, so I will draw randomly for our stack of cards. Well, actually, you know what? We have to do introductions. I'm sorry. <laughs> the candidates are listed alphabetically, so we're going to have them go through and just um, do your introductions to yourself and then your opening uh, statements. So you'll have two minutes, and we'll start with Melissa. All right. Can you stand? If you feel more comfortable. Either way. All right. Um, so I am Melissa Goodbuggin, and I am running for City Council. A little bit about myself. My family moved to Montrose in 1985 when I was two. I grew up in Montrose, attended Montrose Elementary, and Buffalo Junior and Senior High School. In 2001, I attended one year of college at St. Cloud State. In 2002, I transferred to the College of St. Alaska in Duluth. I received my bachelor's in management with a minor in music from there. I lived in Duluth and Hibbing for 11 years and started my family up there, which includes my son Ben, who is six, Buddy, who is our 14-year-old Beagle, and Gracie, our 10-year-old cat. In 2013, I moved back to Montrose to be closer to my family. I have been employed with Craft Pattern and Mold in Montrose since moving back a year and a half ago. My education and career has revolved around accounting, human resources, marketing, economics, and organizational behavior and development. I am a licensed foster care provider through Wright County and PATH, Inc., and provide animal foster care through the Beagle Freedom Project. I am the head of the Beyond the Yellow River Montrose Committee, and I am on the District Community Teaching and Learning Council for District 877. I am also a former Miss Montrose from 2000-2001. During that time, I spent over a year attending over 70 events and promoting our community, including representing Montrose at the St. Paul Winter Carnival and I had the opportunity to be a Minneapolis Aquapennial Queen of the Lakes candidate. Thank you. Armando? Hello, my name is Armando Hernandez. I moved to Montrose roughly about 10 years ago. Uh, I lived 
I was here a year, then I got sent to Iraq for 22 months, came back, came back to Montrose. Love the city. Um, my wife, Ellen Benitez, and I have one child, which is in heaven. And the reason why I think that I want to, well, I know I want to run for the city is, the city did a lot for us when we had the tragedy in our life. And I have sticking a way to repay back what the city has done for us. So at first I joined the celebration committee. That was a way to start giving back. And then I got started getting more involved with the city. And as it turns out, then I decided to run for city council. I have 17 years in the military. I've been through a lot of schoolings as far as leadership, management, and training, which I believe is a great asset that I bring to our city. I believe I'm a candidate that will represent the residents' vision of our city, and that's an asset that I want to keep. I have two associates degrees. One is in computer networking, and the other one is in computer forensics. I'm always bettering myself as far as education so I can better myself and people that I am around. I see a lot of great potential in Montrose. We just got to we need leaders to help us get to that point. We got many leaders that can help us see a new horizon in our city. That's what we got to do here. And that's one of the main reasons that I've decided to run for city council. Thank you. Thank you. And Kirby. My name is Kirby Moyna. Uh, I'm currently 22 years old. Just had my first birthday. It's on. It's on. Okay. Just making sure. I said recently had my birthday. Uh, my son and I, I have a four-year-old son who I have full custody of. Uh, currently, I'm the only parent in his life, and we have a lot of surrounding area family support uh, from a very large group of family, and uh, very grateful for that. Um, I've lived in Montreal since I was three years old, so 19 years. Um, I attended some private school in Delano, St. Pete's. Uh, Montrose Elementary, Buffalo Middle School, and I graduated from Howard Lake in 2011. After I graduated, I went to Central Lakes Community College in Brainerd, and I was there for a year, and then I went to Crown College in St. Bonifacius, where I have studied criminal justice and political science. And since leaving school, I currently work at a residential treatment center for juveniles who have been removed from their home for various reasons, probation violations, and so on. So I work with a very adverse group of clients. Um, I've served as a student liaison at Montreal City Council and served for the Student Senate for Central Lakes. Uh, within three days of being at Central Lakes College, I joined the Student Senate. And within a month, I was in charge of all intramurals. And me and the Vice President started a committee that specifically would work for um, the intramurals and for the student body in regards to all their sports that they had not had before. Uh, I have a lot of great leadership skills, and I think that those are being enhanced now just by working with residential treatment center with kids who, uh, there's quite a few who have mental disabilities and are very tough to work with at times, and I think I can move that into a leadership role in the city yeah. and help. Thank you, Kirby. John? Hello, my name is John Peterson. Uh, my wife and I moved into Montrose in 2004. We have two daughters. Our oldest is eight, her name is Gwendolyn, and our youngest is five, and her name is Josephine. Uh, prior to that, my wife and I lived in Mound for a few years, uh, but I did grow up in Buffalo, and I graduated from the high school there in 1996. My wife grew up in Annandale, so I believe I have a very good understanding of the local area. Um, after high school, I attended at what was Brown Institute at the time. I graduated there in 1998 with an associate degree in radio and television broadcasting. Uh, I've had a lot of really good experience with that career, and I currently work for the city of Shakopee as the telecommunications coordinator. Um, as a family, we enjoy time out together, hiking and visiting uh, state parks. I've played baseball with the Montrose Waverly Stingers for the last two seasons. Uh, I chose to run because I have a desire to bring a posit positive and thoughtful approach to a city that I believe needs a, a better identity. Um, I'm strong-willed and 
interested in learning all the facts behind an issue before jumping to a conclusion. Um, I believe that we need to create a positive community and a positive perception, and that needs to happen <coughs> in Montrose now more than ever. Um, this community needs to be one that residents can be proud of, and I'm hoping that I can help achieve that. Uh, I'm choosing to get out on my own and put effort into doing something good to help make this community a better place. Thank you, John. Ruth? First of all, I want to thank you guys for having us and for all of you guys that showed up. Could you care enough to see what's going on? Um, obviously, my name is Ruth Booth. I moved here in 2011 with my family. Um, prior to that, we were in Cocado and Dasso, so we've been in the surrounding area. I grew up in a small town, Wyoming, Minnesota. Um, my dad was the chief of police there. I know what it's like to be on the, um, the not so fun side of politics, um, having to deal with that. I have college background. I went to the University of Minnesota for a while. I went to an Oak Ramsey. Um, I did not complete my degree because I changed career course. I went to um, Mark Hennepin and got a degree in human resources. I have a license for insurance in two states. Um, my background is pretty diverse. I have managerial background and training. I managed four famous, but we're their largest store in the state. Um, I have been in bookkeeping, human resources, um, accounting, and that's currently what I do now for a large company in uh, Delano. I've got two children that are grown. I have four grandchildren. And of course, most of you know my husband as the town post cop. <laughs> um, one of my children is in the military, so unfortunately, two of the grandchildren are out of state. Um, the reason that I chose to run is I've been attending the council meetings here for about a year and a half and watching what's going on. Um, I think we need a very clear and decisive road to follow. Um, unfortunately, I think there are some areas where we need to improve our reputation, not just with businesses, but just with, even with the residents. I am I, uh, fair. Fine. Fine. Thank you, Bruce. So thank you for all of our council candidates for sharing your opening statements. We're going to move on to our mayor candidates, and we'll start with Roy Henry. Hi, my name is Roy Henry. I'm the mayor of Montrose right now. I am a lifelong area resident, married for 49 years. I have six children, 18 grandchildren, four great grandchildren. I have a lot of experience in how the city works and have served on several committees and volunteered for many things. I have served on the council for two years and over one year as mayor. I have served in planning and zoning committee for many years. Currently, I am a liaison for planning and zoning. As far as volunteerism, I started National Night Out events served as a volunteer fireman, volunteered at school, watered the city containers and flowers on Highway 12, built the benches on the walking path, and many more items to numerous to mention. And my door is always open if anybody's got any questions or problems. I'm willing to listen to see what I can do for them. Thank you, Roy. Ben? Well, my name is Ben Keel. I'm a 32-year-old father of three, and I have a wife, Carrie, who I've been married to for seven years. I've lived collectively in Montrose for five and a half years now. I bought my first house here on Emerson Avenue after graduating Ridgewater Community College with a CNC degree. And after that, I lived here for about two and a half to three years. I followed my wife down to Iowa where I went to work at a CNC production shop and became a lead um, machine, CNC machinist after about two years of being there. And with doing that, I've been able to work with a large variety of people and gain uh, my people skills. But when it came time that my former employer, Kraft Pattern, asked for me to return, I was excited to return back to, to the area. And even better, back to Montrose. Because I was excited because Tony was in the process of buying the old stock lumber building. So I knew that I was going to be able to return back to a community that I loved and I missed. And I am happy to be back here, and I'm happy to have spent the last 16 months representing you, the citizens of Montrose, on our city council. I'm also active in the Beyond the Yellow Ribbon organization, 
with the Montrose Day Celebration Committee. I'm also a member of the Central Minnesota Manufacturers Association and the Tree Walk for Charity that's here in Montrose. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Michelle? Uh, my name is Michelle, and um, I live in Montrose for the past 42 years. I'm a lifelong resident here. Um, I've been with my husband for 26 years. I have four children, one grandson. Um, I am currently on the council. I've been here, for, been on the council for two years. Uh, I've done many volunteering here within the within the town. Um, Montrose Days, Park and Rec, um, Girl Scouts. I'm also a chairperson for the American Cancer Society's Relay for Life. I work at the Trails of Warno with uh, Alzheimer's and dementia patients. I spend most of my time just volunteering here within Machos because this is my hometown and this is where I raise my kids. So I, I feel it's my duty to give back to the, count, to, the, to the community and that is why I am now running for mayor and I look forward to your support. Thank you, Michelle. Greg? Hi, I'm Greg Humans. Um, I've been in Montrose since 1995. I moved here when I retired from service. Um, I uh, have lived in Garfield down here since then. I've raised two boys here that I got when they were about three, so they were mostly housebroke when I got them. Um, they, uh, they grew up and did well in Montrose, and that was a good thing for me. That was one of the things that I was looking for, was a place where I could come to and raise a family. And that's one of the reasons I'm interested in running for mayor, because I believe we need to continue that for people here. As far as my work history um, in the service, I was administrative, and I was a counterintelligence agent. I have worked all over the world. Um, I've worked and run two different field offices, one in Nuremberg and one in, uh, in Wagon in Korea. I've also worked with the Defense Security Office in Korea and run operations throughout the eastern, uh, eastern area. Um, I have a, an associate's degree that I received from Central Texas College while I was assigned in Seoul, Korea. Um, and I studied with University of Maryland, Drake University, and several other universities throughout, and have lots of other classes that didn't culminate yet to a, to a BA. Um, as far as my uh, work after that, I worked for Sears in both a, an asset protection uh, role, as well as the sales manager, and developed through them. Uh, then when they restructured, I went and managed a store in uh, Litchfield. And then I went to work for a company called Horizon Healthcare in the healthcare industry, working with our soldiers and, and veterans, uh, selling them warming products for, for healthcare. Uh, and I've been doing that for some time. Um, as far as um, my community service, I've been a longtime member of the Boy Scouts, served as a Cub Master, a Scout Master, currently as committee chair after Charlie passed away. Um, I've also served on the district staff and at the council staff as well in several positions with the scouts. Um, overall, I, thank you. Thank you, Greg. All right, now we are going to move on to the questions that were given to the candidates ahead of time. And so they each have gotten a card and we're going to just draw from random here. Um, and so the first person that's going to answer the question is number four. And the first question is, tell us about yourself, specifically why is it a good idea for us to vote for you for city council or mayor? What useful experience, knowledge, or perspective will you bring? Who is number four? John. Um, I have 10 years experience working in local government on the administrative team in Shakopee. Uh, through my job, I have worked with city council, various commissions, state and national groups to best serve residents in that area. Um, my goal in running for city council is to create a family-friendly community here in Montrose. Uh, I believe our city needs a measured approach to leadership rather than a re reactionary response. I aim to establish a sense of purpose and positivity in city government to achieve greater goals, to provide a vision for the future, and to provide communi better communication with residents. Um, I have consistently presented this mes message throughout my campaign because I believe that it's the best way that I can serve this community. Thank you, John. All right, the next one is number 10. Armando, tell us about yourself, specifically why is it a good idea for us to vote for you for city council? 
what useful experience, knowledge, and perspective will you bring? Okay, I'm going to start off by saying, with all the 17 years of training that I've had in this service, I've been through a lot of schooling, from management to leadership to training, and I think that's a great asset that I bring to our city. Our city is one of the best cities around here. That's one of the reasons I decided to move to the city. And like I said, the city's done a lot for me, and I have to give back to the city. We have a lot of new developments coming to our cities. We also got to look at the old towns that are in our city, the old sections in our city. They're bringing them up to scale to compete with the new sections that are coming up. We also got to look into having businesses open in the modules. We got to have help with our taxes, help create jobs. We got to look further into the future to make modules a place that people want to come visit, and not just visit, live. So that's, that's why I believe of all the training that I had throughout my whole career, I worked with, in the city government when I lived in Florida. I got a lot of political people <coughs> and Congress that are my family members. So I've seen what they do. I've seen the way that they eat. I've seen what they want to do to where people respect them, want to follow them. And that's why I say I, my goal is to see the residents' vision of what our city is. And I want to be, that's what I'm <coughs> ultimate goal to be able to create that vision for our town. There is, I mean, we got a lot of great people in our town. We got a lot of great people in our, in our city council, but I believe we have to kind of work more together, put our heads together, think about things that we can do, plan ahead before we sit down and talk to one another. So when we do sit down, and talk, we all are on the same page, we're all following the same direction, and we can come up. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Number five. All right. Tell us about yourself, specifically why <coughs> it's a good idea for us to vote for you for city council. What useful experience, knowledge, or perspective do you bring? Well, things have changed quite a bit in the 11 years that I have been gone, but I believe it gives me somewhat um, a more of an outsider's perspective on some of the issues that we face. <coughs> of making educated decisions for myself as an adult and will work hard to make the best decisions for our city by weighing the pros and cons and the cost benefits. Excuse me. <laughs> um, even though I have lots of ideas and things I would like to see happen, I also know that those things don't happen overnight. I will not promise every citizen everything they want to know because or want to see because it is unrealistic. It is also unrealistic that I can claim that I am the best choice for everyone because I can make all of the people happy some of the time, some of the people happy all of the time, but I cannot make all of you happy all of the time. And neither can any other candidate here. We will all do our best. But because my education and career have revolved around accounting, human resources, marketing, economics, and organizational behavior and development, I have a lot of experience in helping a business to run efficiently and smoothly. I've consulted for many businesses on how to reduce overhead and operating costs and have restructured businesses to become more profitable. One business that I consulted for in Duluth was the Peace Corps when they first decided to set up an office in, there in Duluth. The Peace Corps has their own federal rules, but it's up to each individual office to interpret, hire, and maintain the staff, find work for the staff, and come in under their incredibly strict federal budget. We had the organization up and running in four months with 15 full-time volunteers for a paid through tuition reimbursement and a small stipend. By working with the organizations around the loop to assess their needs, we found no shortage of work for those volunteers. The Peace Corps in Duluth has grown exponentially since, since its inception and has helped serve hundreds of people and many organizations throughout the city. This type of work is crucial to getting a business to operate efficiently and to get everyone on the same page. This city is no different than a business. They have people to answer to a budget and a service to provide. Time. Time. Sorry. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks. All right, number six. Who is number six? Me. Brew. <coughs> um, tell us about yourself, <coughs> specifically why is it a good idea for us to vote for you for city council? What useful experience, knowledge, or perspective <coughs> do you bring? Well, I think pointing me to city council has been a cohesive event. Um, the council needs to work together not fight against each other. Um, I do talk into the microphone for, yeah. My experience with management and human resources is going to help with that. I've had to deal with my happy uh, customers and in a 
unfortunately in this business and in dealing with city council, you're going to have people that are unhappy. <coughs> you have to listen and you have to try to respond the best that you can within your, your guidelines or with, with the area that you can. Um, I know how to work with the budget. I know how to stick with it, not just with the uh, business side, but in your home. You have a certain amount of money that you can work with, and that's it. You, there's no room to budget, there's no room to go over. You have to be able to bring that and, and apply it practically to the city council. Um, I have got experience working with the union, which I, I'm not sure if anyone else here does. Um, I work with Twin City Bakery Union, um, going through uh, potential strikes, going through contract negotiations, which could be useful with some of the city employees as well as contracts that we have with other entities such as uh, the Sheriff's Department, etc. Um, everybody knows we need to bring business in. It's a matter of how we do it. It can't be business as usual. There has to be new ideas. There has to be things that are outside the box, things that haven't been tried before. Maybe they won't work. But if you don't try them, you're not going to know. Uh, like Melissa, you're not going to make everybody happy all the time. One thing I won't do is I won't lie to you. I might tell you something that you won't want to hear. I might tell you I can't talk to you about it because it's confidential, but I will Thank talk you. to you. All right, the next one, number nine. <coughs> All right, Ben, tell us about yourself. Why is it a good idea for us to vote for you for city council, mayor? What useful experience, knowledge, or perspective do you bring? <coughs> I believe it's a good idea to allow me to continue to represent you, the residents of Montrose, as your mayor. As for the past four years at Craft Pattern, I have worked as an estimator and our main purchasing agent. The useful knowledge that I bring is in networking with other people and my personal, personal experiences working with contractors and a large variety of clientele. On a daily basis, I am communicating with the customers, <coughs> updating them on what their projects are, I'm also discussing with my subcontractors daily to evaluate the status of the projects that they're working on and the delivery dates that they're going to be returning turning product back to me. This is important to do when running a city to have an open line of communication. I'm personally responsible for over $500,000 worth of product, raw product that is purchased for our day-to-day -day operations. So investigating products and finding a good deal is part of my daily job. Um, so, this has helped me strengthen my communication and people skills. While during doing the research, I often find out that the cheapest product is most often not the best product. With the research, I try to involve the people that are going to be impacted the most by the product that we are looking at to help make their job easier or more efficient. If the product that they suggest ask them for products that they may suggest to help do the business and I look into them and do the research because I feel if it is a suggestion from them it comes from personal experience or their own research and this they are more willing to put an effort into making the product work. Shortly after I joined the city council I went to neighboring communities and saw how they ran their meetings. Wow, I was surprised. My eyes were really open at the proper manners that they used when conducting business. And since April, Hi. I... Thank you, Ben. Thanks. All right, next card drawn is number two. Okay. All right, Greg, tell us about yourself, specifically why is it a good idea for us to vote for you for city council mayor? What useful experience, knowledge, or perspective do you bring? Um, Initially, when I put in my, my name in the hat for, for running, I wanted to run for council. And then I attended a city council meeting, which kind of opened my eyes to the fact that we really don't have a council that's cohesive, and that council does not work well with the administration to produce a cohesive government that responds well to you, the citizens, and protects your interests. And so I changed from council to mayor because that's where I felt I could do the best, the, the most good. Um, I've got a lot of leadership experience where I've worked with lots of people in the past 
who weren't necessarily the best of friends, but we managed to bring those people together cohesively and they work collectively so that we can establish a vision, establish goals and benchmarks so that it'll move us along the process to get to where we need to be. And here in Montrose, that means that we need to become a better city government for you, the citizens. Um, I think that we need to have a cultural change and bring about that cultural change so that we actually have both a council and an administration that work together in order to bring about those changes that we need to see. And that's smart spending, that's uh, strategic planning where we stack things on top of each other so they make sense, where we're looking at um, bringing in businesses to the community and we do things that are smart to, to attract those businesses who have to build from the ground up. And overall, provide a, a government that is both responsive and responsible to the citizens of Montrose. Thank you. Number seven. Um, Michelle, yep. uh, tell us about yourself specifically. Why is it a good idea for us to vote for you for city council mayor? What useful experience, knowledge, or perspective do you bring? Um, as I stated before, I've been on your city council for the past two years. Um, I've worked firsthand with the city staff, the city engineers, and the city attorneys. So I'm knowledgeable on what goes on within that. I've been a part of the budget process. Um, I like to make sure that things are done in a timely manner. So if you have questions or concerns, you know, that the responses that you deserve should be within, you know, the manners that you get, you guys need to get everything taken care of. Um, I want to bring our I want to bring our city closer together. Bring more of a community here. Um, it, it seems to me like you know, like we are divided, and in order to make a successful town, is to bring everybody together to work as a group, not just one, just with not just with one organization, but all of us. To um, I make sure that everybody is fiscally responsible. If you come to um, council meetings, I'm always questioning where money is spent, what what we're doing with things. Um, and if matters come up to us, you know, I investigate things before I actually take action on it. You know, a lot of things have been brought to our attention over the last two years, and it's a responsibility for us to investigate before we actually take action. And um, I just think running for mayor, like I said, I've been here for two years. I've done a lot of good for the community, and um, I just want the community to come and be a whole, not, not divided. So. Thank you. All right, number eight. Three. That's Joe. Oh, it was Joe, wasn't it? It was Joe, sorry. <laughs> That's what I have. Okay, <clears throat> number one. Kirby, uh, tell us about yourself. Why is it a good idea specifically for us to vote for you for city council? What useful experience, knowledge, or perspective do you bring? Well, as I said before, uh, I, used, I was on the student senate when I was at Central Lakes College, and that really helped get me and started in trying to do a political <coughs> of sorts. I've also always enjoyed politics. I've, I've been that weird kid who likes to sit at home and watch the political campaign ads on TV for hours on end and never complained about it. Everybody else always complains that after six months of everybody just hates them. I always watch them. Every hour of them, never turn the channel once. In the last few years, um, I brought softball tournament back to Montrose days and I hadn't been around for numerous years. I remember watching that as a kid, and all the local kids around love watching it. Whether it's a tournament or Thursday nights or Tuesday nights, Monday nights, whatever, I was always up there, other kids were always up there, and now that's back, and we had a real good following the last couple of years, and I hope to keep that going. In the fall of 2012, my dad and I had this idea to take a group of about 20 people from the Montrose, Waverly area, and start a baseball team. And we were told from the beginning it was never gonna happen. Whether it was you didn't have a field, you have no following, there's too many baseball teams around. Well, we got accepted in the North Star League and in the spring of 2013, <clears throat> we had our first official season. It's been a rough start, but we keep getting new people every single year. And I think the reason why we do that is because we have a good leadership between not just myself, my dad, and we get people back every year, and we get new people every year. Um, 
I think that I can help by taking unbiased opinion in a lot of situations. I don't like taking sides, and I like to hear both sides of everything. And I think that if someone comes in and does that, that that will really benefit everybody else by not picking a side, but finding out what the problem really is and taking it from there. Thank you. <laughs> All right, and number three, Roy, tell us about yourself. Specifically, why is it a good idea for us to vote for you for city <coughs> council mayor? What useful experience, knowledge, or perspective do you bring? I was asked by Elfie Mooring, who passed on, was a good citizen of Mount Rose and stuff, for you know, planning and zoning, a couple of other people and stuff like that. And I worked with my dad many years in putting city sewer and water in. We'd done part of Rockford, we'd done part of Waverly with city sewer and water and working with people and septic systems and everything like that. And I got knowledge of sewer systems and stuff like that to help people and to see if they got problems, to help them solve their problems. And if you can't find out what it is, work with them to find out what it is and be fair with the people and what's going on. And I appreciate it. All right, thank you, Roy. All right, we are gonna move on to question number two. And question number two is, how do you view the relationship between the city council and the administration staff? How would you deal with any potential conflict between the two roles? And the first one is number five. That's thank you. So, currently, I view the relationship between the city council and the administration as very tense, distrustful, and strained. Um, but I know that it could be worse. Um, it really, I. The stress of that is something that I don't know how the city council and the staff can work together in that kind of environment. But I think the best way to deal with conflict between the two parties is to do it openly, unless it involves an issue that legally cannot be with <coughs> the public. I think an outside party, such as the city attorney, for example, um, due to his knowledge and expertise with the laws, should moderate, whether it is in private or in public, to keep things civil and legal. I also think both parties need to set aside their past feelings for each other and move forward to deal with issues like adults. The conflict within the city council is also an issue that affects the relationship between the two parties. One thing that I initiated um, was to help the communication between the city council and the citizens um, by providing a quick summary of the meeting so that the citizens wouldn't have to sit through a lot of city council meeting or the video but still have a good idea of what was going on in their community and prompt them to hopefully give some input and become a little more involved. After approval from the city council, I provided the first set of unofficial meeting minutes and they approved that and in turn, they posted it on their website and Facebook page. But after only a few hours, it was taken down due to a complaint by a city council member that had previously approved of doing this. It is these kinds of actions that prompt conflict among city council members, city staff, and citizens. If you had an opportunity to gain easier access to public information, why would you be in support of that? Making accusations or spreading rumors because one person doesn't like another only hurts the city more and creates more distrust among the community. A lot of these issues also come down to ethics. If you can't get along with someone and uphold a strong ethical and moral compass, you have no business working for the city or running for an elected position. Thank you. All right, number seven. <coughs> How do you view the relationship between the city council and the administration staff? How would you deal with any potential conflict between the two roles? Um, I see it as we, we don't just have our administration staff, we also have our public works staff, so we have two groups that we need to work with. Um, <coughs> and since I was elected to become a council, council member, I think that actually the communication has become stronger between the two groups. We now have personnel meetings every two weeks uh, where all of our minutes are taken and given to the full council. And it's not just the mayor and city administration working together. It's all of council and city administration, along with the public <coughs> works working together. Um, I was also part of getting public works to actually sit down with their council members, which they've never done that before, to openly talk about their perspective as to what goes on within the city. And I think that's a good thing to open the communication up with 
not just the people that work in the office, but the people that actually are out in town doing everything that needs to be done for us. Um, if there's any conflicts, um, I feel that we all do need to work together as adults and deal with the conflicts that come. You know, we can't all agree on everything. Um, we just have to work through it and do the best that we can for what, what the city needs. Um, we all have we all have the same purpose here, and that's just to make Montrose a better place to be. So any conflicts that come, I feel that we need to just sit down, talk with you know whatever it is, and deal with it, and just do what is best for Montrose. Thank you. All right, number two. How do you view the relationship between the city council and the administration staff? How would you deal with any potential conflict between the two roles? Well, first of all, the council provides the guidance, the direction, and the oversight as a whole for the, for the city administration. And the council also should be a conduit for the citizens so that you guys have a place to go when you have issues that haven't been resolved by the administration. The administration is expected to run the city efficiently. And that includes all the things that the city is supposed to do for us, the, the taxpayers. That includes the administration, the finances, the police, the fire department, public works, streets, uh, snow removal, and um, the water sewer refuse. All those things add a value to us, the taxpayer. In, on the personnel committee, I think the council members, and I want to be on the, uh, the personnel committee if I'm elected here, will be the, to provide that oversight through proper evaluation and management of the staff in a, in a standard management process where you do personnel management. And that involves doing evaluations that are fact-based, that are based on their performance. You look at doing performance plans for improvement if there are issues that need to be resolved. And you also look at um, merit-based pay that is based upon their performance as well as a market uh, uh, evaluation of similar jobs in that situation. I think we're well out of whack with that right now. Um, I hope that you'll look at people and vote for people that, who will act upon their principles and not just willy-nilly. And the other thing is for conflict resolution. Conflict resolution requires you to be able to put your emotion aside. And you have to be able to listen. And then you work through those processes and come to a, meet, a, a common ground where it's a shared vision of where we need to do and what we need to do to go through that. It doesn't mean that you're going to like each other at the end of it, but the problem is, is that you have to get past that, those, those roadblocks and be able to move forward with it. And part of that has to do with listening to people you, and, and working through those problems. The next one, number four. By the end of the time, I'll know what everybody's number is, I'm sure. Um, how do you view the relationship between the city council and the administration staff? How would you deal with any potential conflict between the two roles? Um, I would agree uh, that the perception of the relationship currently appears to be strained at best. Um, I've heard some people say that it's been combative and confrontational. Um, working in a local government, I have a very straightforward understanding of what the relationship should be. Um, city council members are elected and chosen by the citizens to represent the citizens. City council is responsible for setting the priorities and staff should have the know-how to make those priorities a reality. Um, when council establishes a goal to make a policy, it is the role of the city administrator to see those things are carried out by staff. City Council has no role in city personnel issues. They hire and fire only the city administrator and the city attorney. Uh, the city administrator holds staff accountable, and in turn, the city council holds the administrator accountable for the staff's <coughs> performance. I believe that working together openly and thoughtfully can only be a benefit to everyone involved. Thank you. And number six. How do you view the relationship between city council and the administration staff? How would you deal with any potential conflict between the two roles? Yeah, well, that would be me. Um, the relationship between council and the city administration staff is it's a really important dynamic. Um, the two sides definitely have to work together as one cohesive unit and not fight each other. I think elephant in the room here that everyone 
wants to have addressed is that there were some recent issues where there was investigations done. Right or wrong, you can't just run willy-nilly. You can't just go, I don't like this person, I want them fired. There's protocol to follow. <coughs> At the end of that protocol, if it, if it warrants disciplinary action such as termination, then that's what happens. The administration needs to remember that the council directs them, the admin does not direct the council. The council is responsible to you, the taxpayers, for every dollar, for every action. So I just think that we need to work with that a little bit more. We need to regain the trust. We need to <coughs> clean house, maybe. That may be the answer. But I'd like to work on it. Great, thank you. Number one, how do you view the relationship between the city council and the administration staff? How would you deal with any potential conflict between the two roles? Well, after talking to a few people, uh, knocking on doors and such, they, the general opinion is that there is some tension between the administration and the city council. Um, the thing that I would do would come in with an unbiased opinion and take the situation as a whole and try to break it down to have everybody work together as, as best as possible. We're there to better the city as a council and administration. The administration works for all the citizens as well as the council does. And if the citizens aren't happy with how something's going on, then we need to do our best to step it up to what their standards are. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with accountability. And part of that is that we, as a council, need to hold the administration <coughs> accountable for their actions. If they're doing something wrong, they need to step it up to what we think their performance standards need to be. If we're not doing something right as a council member or something illegal like that, then it's it'd be nice to have some direction from either fellow council members that you're doing something wrong so that you don't step out of bounds, or from even administration who've been there for a long time to say, all right, this isn't okay to do. We need to do this in a different direction. And I think that I can do that and come in and resolve the situation if there's tension between two council members or administration and council and come in and say, all right, this is your side, this is your side, now where can we meet in the middle and better our relationship together. Thank you. Number three, how do you view the relationship between the city council and the administration staff? How would you deal with any potential conflict between the two roles? Well, the relationship between the city council and administration staff is something that I don't feel should be discussed. Most personal issues are considered private, not public. To talk about specified things that have happened, good or bad, would be a possible <coughs> violation of privacy. Also, I don't see how these candidates running for the first time could answer the question since they haven't had relationships with the staff. We have a procedure in place to deal with potential conflicts that we have to work with people that the conflicts are all about and see if we can work the problems out to get everything solved. Thank you, Roy. Number nine, how do you view the relationship between the city council and the administration staff? How would you deal with any potential conflict between the two roles? I can't speak for the rest of the city council, but I have a great relationship with the city staff. I feel that it's very good to have a good relationship with the staff and the employees. When I do ask the city staff or employees questions, they may not get to me back to me right then and there, but they do get back to me in a timely fashion. And if there is a conflict that would need to be reviewed, we need to see what type of severity level is this, and then discuss between the two parties to see what we can do to remedy the situation. With my personal experience, that I have, I'm able to step back and take a look at the situation and make a judgment or an opinion without my emotions taking effect. I believe that there will always be conflict when running a business, but it's how you deal with these conflicts that make you and the business grow stronger. I have received many compliments for my ability to work with many different people and diff with different personalities and different cultural backgrounds. With doing this, both my current job and my past job as being a lead operator. And a point to ponder here 
you need to think of the city council as an admiral, giving direction of the boat where you're going. But it's the city staff's responsibility to get you between those ways, between A and B. We are there to advise them and give them some direction. It's their job to do it. Thank you, Ben. And number 10, how do you view the relationship between the city council and the administration staff? How would you deal with any potential conflict between the two roles? Well, I believe there's always going to be conflicts. The key behind it is how do you handle those conflicts? <coughs> you sit with the other person, you talk about it, you can't come to a conclusion, you bring another person in and analyze the situation. But it's something that's done in the private, it's not done out of the public. We gotta act like, I like professionals. We gotta handle things like professionals. This is, this is really a business. It's gotta be handled as a business. The way you treat a person is the it's a big factor behind it. If everybody works together a lot better, there will be less conflicts. I'm not saying there's never gonna be a conflict. There's always a lot of conflicts out there. It's just the way how you handle it and how you perceive yourself in handling those situations. Thank you. And we're moving on to question number three. All right, the number, third question. What do you see as the city of Montrose's major challenges and assets? The first person to answer is number four. Um, you know, as I've gone around the various neighborhoods so far, and I haven't had a chance to get out to every once, and I, I aim to do more of that this weekend, but as I've knocked on doors, I've, I've realized something that I really hadn't noticed. And it seems to me that Montrose really needs to create an identity that residents can be proud of and rally behind. Uh, there seems to be such a strong passion out there for the city to have locations with programs that our children can participate in without having to go out to another town. Um, the formation of a soccer club or a town baseball team can drive a community to be close and cohesive. Those ideas can bring revenue and pride into our town, something it seems like we're desperately lacking. Uh, just those couple ideas alone also give children a place to go. It creates programs within our community. Uh, it gives uh, residents of something that they can grow along with. Um, it's time to stop being looked at as Buffalo's second fiddle. Um, beyond that, Montrose needs to focus on economic development. It needs to bring in community and family attractions and new businesses. I'm willing to work with staff, other commissions, outside groups to achieve these goals. And I want to represent, represent the resident's voice and the overall community interest. Um, Montrose has its biggest strength, I believe, in its general city location right at the crossroad of County Road 25 and State Highway 12. Um, there's no reason that Montrose should be worse off than Cocado, which seems to have a much stronger sense of community and definitely has more developed with the amenities and programs that it's offering its residents. Thank you. And number three, what do you see as the city of Montrose's major challenges and assets? <laughs> Well, the city of Montrose has major challenges with keeping tax costs down but still trying to provide all the services people want. Roads and infrastructure are two of the most expensive challenges. The major assets are in people in small town living along with a good school system for kids in parks and walking trails and to keep our streets up and maintained so we ain't got so many problems with them. That's why the city purchased this new truck now which is a lot nicer and will cut back on our overtime with our employees and do a better job on the streets. Thank you. And number six, what do you see as the city of Montrose's major challenges and assets? Well, I think the challenges and the issues are already pretty well known. We already know there's a demand for services um, for greater public transportation access, or the business space, um, resolution with police coverage, uh, speeding, I and mean, people, people know what the issues are. The solutions to them are not necessarily so easy. If they were easy, they'd already be fixed. 
it's going to take some out-of-the-box thinking, and we need to put together maybe a think tank to come up with some different ideas. Um, maybe the city needs a land bank. Maybe we need to find some money to help the businesses that are here already expand or refresh. Um, it's just going to take a lot of people working together to come up with some solutions. Our biggest assets are the citizens. Our residents here are great. People want to volunteer, they just need to know where to go to do it. I don't think we have a very clear cut place for them to go and look and say, hey, this is what I can do. Um, our other great asset is being so close to the cities. We're, we're very close to, you know, to the Twin Cities for people that work there. But our housing is still affordable. So you can kind of have the best of both worlds. We have a great, great space here. It just needs to be promoted more. Thank you. And number one, what do you see as the city of Montrose's major challenges and assets? I think one of the best assets that Montrose has um, from talking to people is the volunteer base. We have a, a good volunteer pay, base and everybody's always willing to help people out. The other side of that is that it seems to be the same people every time and it would be nice to get more people involved with helping the community and expanding that volunteer base. Um, just kind of looking things up online and everything, it's our average age in Montreal is right around 28 to 30. I think that, as John had said, that we need to expand the city and, and have it grow into a better identity. And I think if we get these younger families to help with the volunteer base, that they can help grow Montrose into something that everybody else would like to be at, somewhere everybody else would like to live. Um, Everybody kind of has the same opinion as that we need more businesses here, and it would be nice to have more businesses here. Whether it be, you know, just a small little convenience store or something to help get some groceries and whatever you need, hardware. Um, we have a good location, as John said, that right on Highway 12 and 25. It seems that some of the local, other local towns have more amenities than we do, even though we're one of the bigger ones around. We're almost the same size as Delano. We're bigger than Cocado, Howard Lake, uh, I think we're even bigger than Watertown. And they have more amenities than we do, and it doesn't make sense as to why. And one thing that I would do, and I hope my fellow council members or people running here would do, is to work with planning and zoning, and or businesses, or even county commissioners to help bring in more businesses here and make Montrose a better place everybody wants to be at. Thank you, Billy. <coughs> And number nine, what do you see as the city of Montrose's major challenges and assets? The city has many challenges that it faces. As all communities face challenges, it's how they deal with them that set them apart. One of the main challenges that I feel that Montrose has is too many people talk before finding out the facts or only tell part of the story that makes them sound good. I've experienced this as a result of the negative comments about our city while visiting another community. I use that situation as a stepping stone to change their perspective about our community. We as representatives of Montrose need to be promoting Montrose as a great town to live in and a great location for businesses in everything that we do. I was able to, to do this as I re represented Montrose at the State of the Cities address in Delano this past spring. In February, I asked Joanne Faust, the head of our EDA, to bring the idea of giving a discount on building permits to home builders building homes of $225,000 and above. I believe that this could help increase our second level homes here in Montrose, giving our citizens more options to move up to and expand into versus moving into other communities to find that second level home. This would greatly help our community out as businesses look to call Montrose home. During this meeting, I was, I was only supported by two EDA members, and they are not on our current city council. This was disappointing, as I thought the EDA members were here to try and promote our community and help it grow. Our assets are a great location in the metro. We have a lot of, of great entry-level homes at price points that are, are easy to get into and a bunch of different styles. We also have an abundance of parks and trails 
for our citizens to enjoy, and along with the new regional park that's in its beginning stages. And this is going to be a great addition to the future generations of Montrose. Thank you, Ben. All right, number 10. What do you see as the city of Montrose's major challenges and assets? Well, one of the major challenges I see is that we have businesses that open up in Montrose, and at the same time they close. Why? Why, why are we not helping these businesses stay open? What are we doing wrong? We got to bring businesses in, but make them stay, not just open for a couple of years and then they're gone. And I've been seeing that a lot here in Montrose. So we got to do something. We're doing something wrong that's making these businesses leave our town. So we got to figure out what we have to do to make those businesses stay and bring new businesses into town. And the biggest asset that we have is we have a bunch of volunteers in Montrose that want to do stuff to better our community. But nothing happens because we don't have enough volunteers. We just got to get, get the word out there saying, what can we do to better our city? And unite with these people that do volunteer to help our cities and make it a better city. Thank you. And number five, what do you see as the city of Montrose's major challenges and assets? Um, I think two of the challenges that I think we face are adding and retaining business, of course, and cohesiveness as a community. Um, I have been emailing with Joanne, um, who is the head of the ADA, to find a suitable space so that we can retain a business here in Montrose that is hopefully only temporarily moved out of town. Andrea Reese, who owns Andrea Reese Photography, has been running her business out of her home in Montrose, but has recently moved to Delano and does not have the space in her home to do that anymore. She wants to keep her business in Montrose because it is a central location for her clients, but needs help finding a suitable space. So I have been communicating with her and Joanne to find some available spaces that will suit her needs so that she can continue to relocate her business back to Montrose. Attracting a new business or trying to retain one is not a task that is done overnight. I know citizens get frustrated with the lack of business, but it is definitely not for a lack of trying. The other side to this that I feel many citizens don't quite understand is the economic feasibility of bringing a business in. Any business exists to make money. With such a limited population, it can be hard to attract a business on a grander scale, unless a private citizen decides to open it themselves or the community comes together to form a co-op. I'm not saying that it is not possible to bring any type of business in, but we have to look at the economics in our area and work around them to try and find a better solution. The more people that continue to move into our community, the better chances for businesses to move in as well. Becoming cohesive as a community can also help further our chances of growing stronger. One of our assets is our citizens and our volunteers and our parks and all of the wonderful organizations we have. I know schedules are crazy, and each family has their own challenges to deal with, but take even a few moments to put in your two cents, volunteer a couple of hours doing a cleanup, being a part of an organization, or being neighborly are simple steps that can make us grow stronger. Providing a sense of responsibility to our community will attract others. Thank you, Melissa. And number two, what do you see as the city of Montrose's major challenges and assets? The two major things that I found when talking with people door to door, uh, one has been the fact that we don't have any business and enough businesses here in Montrose. I think the biggest issue we need to do there is to work uh, uh, proactively with EDA, uh, with leveraging some of the assets that we do have, like the Preserve of Montrose, uh, providing tax incentive both near term and long term, so that we can attract businesses because they have to start from the ground up when they come here. So we need to look at that and, and develop a, a, a strategy, if you will, to attract those businesses. The other thing that I hear is that our water bills are too high. The water, sewer, storm, um, and treatment and refuse constitutes about 50% 50, 50 of our $4.4 million budget. So it's a huge expense. And I think we really need to look at it closely and determine how we can make that a, a, a more cost-effective piece of the, of the pie for us. I think working with Sean on that and developing strategies to approach that and, and tweak that will help us to get there and reduce that cost for us and, and be able to pass that directly on to the citizens. The other piece is our taxes, and that's the, the city level, level levy overall. is about $100 per person, children and adults included, higher than Plymouth, Buffalo, Watertown, St. Michael, and St. Bonnie. So, and it's about $500 higher than the average Minnesota city. 
So clearly we need to tighten the belt just a little bit. I think that's a big issue. Um, one of the other things I'd look at is community level policing. We spend about $176,000 last year for, for policing with Wright County part-time. And they primarily police the, the through fares and not really get into the communities. They don't do uh, enforcement of, of city ordinances. Uh, they're not looking at stopping speeders on the streets that are within the, in the, uh, the, the, the residential areas. I think we need to look at how we approach community level policing and I think we can do that on a, at a cost-effective basis. And number seven, what do you see as the city of Montrose's major challenges and assets? Um, I think the major assets that we had that we have here in town, as everybody has said, is our volunteers. Um, we have great volunteers in different organizations, whether it's Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Lions, Montrose Days. They're all great, and that's what brings our community together. So that I think is a wonderful asset that we have. Um, some of the challenges that we have, is, as we've said, um, is businesses. And being on the council for the past two years and working with the EDA, it is hard to bring a business here in the town. Um, not only getting the business here, but keeping the business here. We as a community have to support the business once it comes here, whether it's having our different functionings there, you know, just going there and supporting them, you know, whether it's once a week or once a month, whatever it is, just be there to support the businesses that we have and that we do bring in. Um, I also think that another challenge that we have is, as we have said, is the United Council. Um, for the past two years that I've been on your council, there's been two members of the council that um, have brought a lot into the city. And, you know, we're here um, not for personal agendas. I'm, you know, we're here for the whole community. So, and if you have a personal agenda, you, you can't get anything done. Um, we're not just up here just, you know, to have the votes in once, you know, just come in, meet in once a month. We're here to look into things, bring the community together. And I think that one of the challenges that we do face is um, everybody working together, working as a whole. And we need to remember that we're here for Montrose and to make it better, whether it's bringing in businesses, whatever it may be. Um, that is what I feel is, you know, got to get businesses and everybody support each other and do the best that we can for Montrose. Thank you, Michelle. All right, our last question um, is, a resident calls you and says there are people speeding on their street and proposes a solution to solve the problem. How would you address this resident's concern? <coughs> the first person to address this question, number four. Um, to me, I read this question really speaking toward Speeding in general in the residential area, and how uh, as a city council member would I interact with a resident? Um, to me, what I would do is encourage the resident to approach the city council as a whole and remind them of my belief that issues are best handled as a group rather than as a personal agenda. Uh, beyond that, I would want to learn if other residents in that area agree with the concern or if this is just one person's uh, opinion. Um, if it was identified as a neighborhood concern, I would want to present the issue to city council as a whole if the resident wasn't available to be there themselves. And I would want to work with my city council partners uh, to provide the best solution um, and see and identify what those options are that we can do. I might suggest starting by working with the Wright County Sheriff's Department. I might uh, suggest implementation of digital speed signs in that area. I would look at maybe uh, seeing if we could post a sheriff vehicle into that area um, over a specified amount of time, randomly throughout the day or a month or whatever, and see if they can address those issues directly, and if possible, can they report back to City Council with what they uh, found out on the street. Um, I believe if we find out that more needs to be done, then again, the City Council as a group needs to sit down and decide what the best me measures are uh, for those residents and their safety. Thank you. And number nine, a resident calls you and says there are people speeding on their street and proposes a solution to solve the problem. What would you, how would you address this resident's concern? We need to review the problem and get all the details, such as is there a certain time of day that's worse than others? 
Are there a lot of cars or just a few? And if there is a certain time of day that is worse for these traffic violations, I would ask if myself and another council member could go to this area and observe and see what the situation is. After reviewing the situation, at that time we can make the decision. Is this something that we do need to get the law enforcement involved with or not? And a valuable tool that we could potentially use is the radar trailer that the county already has and it is free of charge. The only thing that we'd have to do is get on the waiting list so that we, we can use it. And with the citizens' solution to solving the problem, it should be revolved resolved to see how practical this is. Some resolutions may not be a good idea for our town, such as speed bumps. They do slow down traffic, but they oftentimes, they offset the benefits because after they've crossed the speed bumps, the noise from the rapid acceleration is, is not good. Um, another option is roundabouts. They do slow down traffic, and, but they're not a particular good for in town. They're hard to remove snow from, and they take up a lot of space. In the end, whatever the resolution is, we need to thank the citizen for their efforts in working to make our community a better place. Thank you, Ben. Number 10. A resident calls you and says there are people speeding on their street and proposes a solution to solve the problem. How would you address this resident's concern? Well, first of all, you, you would ask the resident, is there a pattern behind it? Is there a specific vehicle? Is it multiple vehicles? Are you the only one seeing this? Are the other people involved? Um, then after you've got all your information, then you would sit down with your city council members and decide what path, what steps we can take to find out what is going on. Do we, do we have to get the local sheriff involved? Do we have to use speed signs? What is it that we have to do to make sure we provide the safety that we need for our residents? I mean, we, we got to look at it. We got a lot of little developments with a lot of kids around. And that's a big concern because I see that all the time, right? That people just big by. I'm a little crazy. I just get up front of them and tell them to slow down. But it doesn't always work. We have to get other things implemented to help stop that situation. Thank you. Number five, a resident calls you and says that there are people speeding on their street and proposes a solution to solve the problem. How would you address this resident's concern? Um, well, I would address it very similarly to um, what others have said so far. Um, assessing what is happening, are there other people that are seeing this, what is going on, what time of day, things like that. Um, if it does seem to be a problem and it's not just an individual problem, um, possibly talking to our local law enforcement when they are here um, to assess, you know, what is the feasibility of this plan that the citizen has? Is it legal? Is it something we can enforce? How would that work? If it is something that they are behind, then it would be time to bring it to City Hall um, where the citizen could propose the plan and the law enforcement official would also be there to speak to the legalities of it. Um, but I also think the city should start looking into increasing our police pr presence, excuse me, around the community to combat this issue because it's one that I hear over and over again and I see almost every day in my own neighborhood. Um, weighing out the cost of starting our own police force even on a limited scale is something that we as a city can very feasibly start considering for the very um, far future, but we can start. As we continue to grow, we will need to provide more and better services for our community to combat those issues. Thank you, Melissa. And number two, a resident calls you and says there are people speeding on their street and proposes a solution to solve the problem. How would you address this resident's concern? First of all, I need to listen to the, to the citizen's uh, solution and identify, right, get all the facts, um, get the details with them, find out if it's a recurring issue, whether it's happening a lot, uh, see if there's any time today where it's happening, if they have any pictures or any video of it, uh, or if they can identify the person. And then once they provide that solution, then we have to evaluate that solution, see if it's feasible, see if that will work, or if it's a workable solution to it. Um, the other piece of it is to uh, look at getting in touch with Wright County, which is currently providing the law enforcement for us, see if they can increase the police presence in that area, particularly in times if that's a recurring thing at a given time of day, and then they can address that individual directly. Um, the other thing is to follow up with the citizen as well. I think it's a, 
once we get something that comes to us, we need to make sure that we have that positive follow-up with them. Overall, it has to do with providing better community-level policing. And that's one thing I'm very passionate about, is making sure that we, we drive those police services down into the communities where they protect our citizens and make sure that they protect our children when they're out on the streets. That's a big thing. Uh, we are definitely a family community, and we want to make sure that we're safe. Thank you. Number three, a resident calls you and says there are people speeding on their street and proposes a solution to solve the problem. How would you address this resident's concern? Well, I would listen carefully to the resident's solution before I commit. If the solution sounded okay, I would move forward to solve the issue. My first contact would be the Red County Sheriff's Office. Sometimes the solution they want is impossible. You should always explain why and search for a new way of solving the issue. Well, I go talk to this person and see what's going on. And with the speed limit sign, I talk to Tom Dupont out of St. Cloud with MnDOT and all that. And if you go into a cul de sac, you can have a speed limit at 25 miles an hour. But if you go on a straight road, the speed limit is 30 miles an hour, and there's no way you can change it. Thank you. Number seven, a resident calls you and says there are people speeding on their street and proposes a solution to solve the problem. How would you address this resident's concern? Um, I actually have first-hand knowledge of this because uh, the school principal has contacted me about speeders and um, people not stopping for the crosswalk on 2nd Street and Buffalo Avenue. Um, so what I did was I went there and I observed it um, and found that it is an issue. So therefore, I've been working with the school to bring this to the attention of the Wright County officers who are now, um, they have the police presence at the crosswalks and are checking for speeders on 2nd on Second Street and Buffalo Avenue. Um, I've also worked with our city engineer to get with the Wright County um, Highway Department to see, to get crosswalk signs and school zone signs up on the streets, as because we don't have that right now. So to make people more aware, not to speed in those areas where the kids are, and uh, to just, you know, maintain their speed, watch for kids, stop for crosswalks. You know, it's all about working with, going to the right connections and working with the people that you need to address these, which is Wright County, the school, the city engineer, to get all of this stuff in place and to get it taken care of. Um, I've also worked with the property owner on 2nd Street there to get a sign put back onto his property that says that is the school's location. So people, we have so many people here that are new into town that don't realize that that is where our school zone area is and that is a major traffic area for speeders and people not watching for the kids in the crosswalks. So that I have it now to where I've worked with the property owner to put the school sign back in their lot so people, you know, are more cautious to slow down. And you just got to work the proper channels and that is, you know, working with the schools and making sure that Wright County is there now in the mornings watching the patrols and in the afternoons when the kids are doing the crosswalks before and after school. So. Thank you, Michelle. Number six, a resident calls you and says there are people speeding on their street and proposes a solution to solve the problem. How would you address this resident's concern? Well, first of all, I'm going to actually take the call and not avoid it or let it go in the answering machine because the uh, citizen's upset. They need to vent. You need to listen to them to the entirety, whether it takes five minutes or it takes an hour. They need to be heard. While you're talking to them, you need to be taking good notes and asking questions so that you fully understand the full scope of what their complaint is and what their suggestion or solution is. I think part of the problem actually is Wright County. I don't think they're necessarily <coughs> of the solution. That is where an idea of having a local constable where we have more control of and they actually answer to the council instead of doing their own thing would be of great value. Once you have all the information, your current path would be to talk to either council's police liaison or the sheriff's department and see if you can come up with a resolution that the um, citizens are happy with. Then you do have to follow up with that citizen. Since you're the one that got the call, it's your responsibility to do what you can to fix it and go back to the citizen and respond to them so that they feel like they have been heard, that they've been part of the uh, solution to their issue. Thank you. And number one, a resident calls you and says there are people speeding on their street and proposes a solution to solve the problem. 
How would you address this resident's concern? Well, the first thing is I'd ask them where it's at and when it's happening and kind of observe for myself with other people. And after looking at it and, and you know, check the links to the roads, number of intersections they have, existing tra traffic control devices, number of crashes that roads had or accidents, and compile it all and bring that to the council and it would be something that we need to bring the sheriffs in on. Um, I do like the idea of a speed, you know, trailer, but at the same time I don't. I would rather, and I've had it recommended to me by sheriffs that I work with at my job that a speed strip is the best idea to take in areas like this because people look at it and it shows you what your speed is. I'm not gonna drive by that going 50 miles an hour and 30 and go, or oh, let me see if my speedometer's right. If the speed strip's there, you're gonna get a true accurate reading and it'll just compile all the data. You take it when it's done with, and once you know what the real facts are, it's a consistent problem at a certain time, ask the right county sheriffs to step up patrols in this area at that certain time so that we don't have an accident with small children or other drivers. All right, thank you. Well, that concludes all of our predetermined questions for the council candidates. Um, and now we actually have a fishbowl of questions that were submitted by the audience members. And so we're going to draw randomly. I'm just going to ask somebody to pick one. So, um, this is the wild card. I All right, well, I, I am going to uh, address, I'm going to change it just a little bit. The question originally reads, why as mayor would you want to reduce the pl uh, police contract by 5% to alleviate the 5% budget overage? Um, I'm going to say as a mayor or council member, why would you want to reduce the police contract by 5% to alleviate the 5% budget overage? And the first person to address that is, or to answer that, is number five. Can you read the question one more time? I can. Okay. Why as mayor or council member would you want to reduce the police contract by 5% to alleviate a 5% bud budget overage? Well, as a city council member, I would not want to reduce the police budget by 5%. Um, I think that is a very important part of our budget. Um, I would take a look at the budget and see if there is another place where we can shift things around or we could possibly take that 5% from. Um, I can guarantee that there are several cost-cutting measures I'm sure we as a city can take to make up that 5% because I'm sure that the, the issue we just discussed, nobody wants to see any reduction in our police force at this time. Thank you. Number six. Why, as mayor or council, would you want to reduce the police contract by 5% to alleviate the 5% budget overage? Well, as Melissa just said, no one wants to necessarily see the police coverage diminished. However, restructuring that contract, we are currently paying almost double what Waverly is or Howard Lake is paying for the same coverage. We need to renegotiate that contract. We're paying way, way too much money for it. Um, that's going to take up that, that budget shortfall. You're going to save more than 5%. The other option, of course, is to go in with your own department as a constable, not as a full-fledged department. That's going to be a cost-saving measure as well. And as I said, they're going to answer to the citizens and to the council directly. They're going to be here. They're going to be invested. Thank you. Number four, why as mayor or council would you want to reduce the police contract by 5% to alleviate the 5% budget overage? Um, I think I agree with what some of Melissa's statements were. I would have initially evaluate the overall budget to see what other services or programs uh, where they could be uh, a reduction from there. Uh, if we had a 5% overage in our overall budget, I, I feel like public safety is the last place that I want to look to reduce the budget. However, if there is an issue with our police contract, uh, to know that we're paying almost double um, from some of the other communities, I would certainly look at, at renegotiating <coughs> that contract. And if, 
in doing that, we're able to save five percent or more within the budget. Then I think that's a good place to, to look at you. Thank you. Number seven. Why, as mayor or council, would you want to reduce the police contract by five percent to alleviate the five percent budget overage? Um, we do need to look at the coverage that Ray County offers us right now and the times that they're here. Um, they're here more often during the day, which, you know, in the summertime that's great, but in the wintertime we need to readjust that because the kids are in school. So um, our coverages need to be changed, and Wright County needs to realize that we don't always need them between 11 and 2, you know, we need to have them between 6 and midnight or whatever it might be. Um, I don't think we need this. Right now we are currently paying $15,000 a month for Wright County coverage. And, you know, I don't think they're offering us the best that they can. Um, as Greg had stated earlier, they need to get more into, into, into the community. You know, not just circle the town and, you know, check the main aspects of town. They need to get more into the community. So, um, to actually reduce by 5%, I think we just need to look at ways of um, changing the structure as to what it is right now. Thank you. And number three. Why, as mayor would, or council, would you want to reduce the police contract by 5% to alleviate the 5% budget coverage? I think we could do better if we had our own police force with a chief of police and another assistant, a deputy. We could go buy a county car when they got the auction going on for the miles that they were put on just in town here. We could save the city a lot of money and a lot of tax money. Thank you. And number 10. Why, as mayor or council, would you want to reduce the police contract by 5% to alleviate the 5% budget overage? Well, first of all, community safety should be our main concern. That shouldn't even be a consideration of cutting out a budget for 5% to reduce our police presence. I believe that other avenues we could take as far as maybe contracts or having our own local police, but that should be the last thing in our minds as far as when it comes to safety. We hear the concerns that we have with the crosswalks at school. We hear the concerns that the citizens have in their, their little towns, their little communities. We can't do that much because we just got to find out other avenues to take and keep our police presence or boost up our police presence. Thank you. And number one, why as mayor or council would you want to reduce the police contract by 5% <coughs> to alleviate the 5% budget overage? Well, I was looking at reducing a budget and that was one of the areas that actually had me affected. Changing by 5% or lowering it, raising it, whatever, I want to make sure that if we lower it, we're not going to get less coverage. By lowering it, you know, whatever that is, eight and a half thousand, about eight and a half thousand, that we're not going to get less coverage from the county or whoever we're contracting with. That we're still going to have that presence here no matter what. If we're lowering it and losing coverage, then it's not the right thing for us, and maybe we need to find someone else to contract with, or like people have said, if it's cost effective to get our own police department. A lot of places don't have that. Recently found out even Chan Hansen does not even have their own police department, because it's cheaper for them to contract out with Carver County than it is to get their own <coughs> and buy their own squad cars. So if lowering it was an option we needed, as long as we're not losing coverage from who we're contracting with, then yes, it would be a good idea, but if we're losing coverage, then no, I would not want to risk lives or accidents by lowering it. Thank you. Number two, why as mayor would you want to reduce, or council, reduce the police contract by 5% to alleviate the 5% budget overage? Well, first of all, I don't think that we need to reduce the coverage that we have. I think that we need to look at how we actually are, are, are enforcing the safety within the community itself. Um, I firmly believe that we're not getting the bang for the buck. If you look at what we're getting from Wright County, you look at the police plotters, they're not giving us true policing the way we would expect it in our communities. We spent $176,000 last year for Wright County to do policing for us. So a reduction of 5% is nine grand. I think that if we have to look at that just on the dollars, we can find other places rather than public safety to find that money. We're budgeted for $182,000 this year. I know that Howard Lake has two full-time <coughs> officers, three part-time officers, and I, it's reported to me that they spend about $300,000 a year. So for about double what we've got, we could have a full-fledged police force in Montrose 
and, and we need to find where we get that from. But I think we need to reevaluate how we bring community safety to Montrose and look at that from the standpoint of, of getting a bang for the buck and what's best for our citizens of Montrose so we can get a full spectrum policing and full spectrum coverage for safety within the community. Thank you. And number nine, why as mayor or council would you want to reduce the police contract by 5% to alleviate the 5% budget overage? I would not want to reduce our police coverage in any way, shape, or form. I know that as I sit in my house <coughs> or sit out in my front yard with playing with my daughters, I watch the sheriffs drive by my house often and I'm I'm almost at the end of, end of my community, so I know there is not a through street. So I, I see police presence. I see it at work. I see watch them take their breaks around around our community, in our community. So I think we do have it. We do have police presence. Could there could we change when they're here? Alter some of that stuff? Yes, I do think we can. But I know that us starting up our own police force right here right now is not feasibly possible with what we have. It takes a great deal of money. You need to buy a car. You need to equip a car. You need to buy stuff for, for your police officers. You need to equip them. And then there's so many dollars that are in the background that we don't see and know about every day that starting up our own police force or would be uh, very detrimental to do 100% at, at once. If we slowly set money aside to start Putting it, putting it away for a later date, we could do that. But just to start up right here, right now, I don't think that's a good idea. We would raise our taxes, and we'd have. I don't think we. I don't think would be in our best interests. Thank you. All right. The next question. Sorry, Reads, for years, Montrose has had a negative image. What will you do to change that image? To start out with the question, number four. Um, I feel like I've stated a lot of that um, previously, but to echo what I've already said, I, I want to bring uh, a positive approach to uh, the decisions that are being made at the city council level. My goal would be to work hand in hand with my city council partners to make the best decisions that we can and uh, improve the residents' lives uh, and their community, uh, their programs that are offered, the amenities that are offered. I just, um, I feel like in my experience going around door to door that we had a lot, that I've had a lot of people express interest in being involved in the community and um, participating in different programs and I'd like to see that actually happen and my goal would be to provide the avenue to achieve that. All right, thank you. And number seven, for years Montrose has had a negative image. What will you do to change that image? Um, I feel that what we need to do is just be out in our community and talk positively about the community and about the wonderful volunteers that we have that are here. The, um, the parks and trails that we have, you know, it's, we have to let the people know what Montrose has to offer. You know, just put the past behind us and move on and, and let Montrose grow to what it really can be. Um, we as a community, city council, and volunteers that are out there, we just all have to work together to make everything positive, bring our organizations together, and just be out there talking positively about Montrose and helping the community thrive. Okay, thank you. And number three, for years Montrose has had a negative image. What will you do to change that image? I'd like to see more businesses come forward in town. We've got money to help the businesses out to come to town, offer them an incentive that we can work with the people and get more people on the road. Thank you. 
Number two, for years Montrose has a negative image. What will you do to change that image? I think the council and the mayor are ambassadors of the city. We represent the city in a lot of different places. I think that we need to be, be careful about how we present things and that we show the shiny side of Montrose. And Montrose does shine. I mean, we really have a lot of positive things. But sometimes we end up dwelling on the negative and forget about the positive. And that's one of the things we have to check. And, and how we talk about our community has to do a lot with how others perceive what our community is. And particularly when our, our council and our, and our elected representatives speak negatively about issues, then, I mean, airing dirty laundry in public is never a good thing. I think that we need to make sure that we, we speak about the good things. And if there are issues that we need to address, then we address those issues and we work at them. And people will see that we're actually taking an effort to improve those things and making a, Montrose a better place. And uh, I believe Montrose has a lot of good things to offer it. Offer it. it has since I've lived here. Uh, it, it let me grow, grow two great kids here. And I think that there's still more to come. So I think we need to promote that. Thank you. And number nine, for years Montrose has had a negative image. What will you do to change that image? I'll do what I've been continuing to do as being appointed on the city council. Like I said earlier, you know, going over to Delano and given that opportunity to give the state of the city address and be a positive role model and be professional and positive in what we do, it's, it's great and very, very good for our community. Everywhere we go, we need to be promoting our community, promoting our, our business parks, promoting shingle bees, promote, you know, and, and everything that we do. And like it's been said before, you know, patronizing our local establishments, you know, once a week, once a month doing what we can to not only grow what we have here, but promote our city, show people that we do shine. You know, we can shine, and we're, we've been here for a long time, and we're not gonna go away. Thank you. Number 10, for years Montrose has had a negative image. What will you do to change that image? Well, first of all, we gotta let people know that we are heading in the right direction. We are trying to do things to improve our town. We just gotta let them know about it and actually show them that just let them know about it and act as professionals within our city hall and our council members and that will bring a big positive impact to our city. Thank you. Number one, for years Montrose has had a negative image. What will you do to change that image? Well I think bring in some positive leadership and somebody who can fulfill a good leadership role and step up and say, all right, I want to lead this city in a positive way and not talk behind people's back or discuss city business outside of city hall or outside of meetings and not get into arguments in the middle of public meetings. It'd be nice if somebody stepped in as a leader and said, all right, this is how we're gonna do things. We're gonna be professionals. You know, we may not be friends, but we're gonna get along for the sake of the city. And I think if we change just how everybody in town views us, I think other cities will follow in line. Thank you. Number five, for years Montrose has had a negative image. What will you do to change that image? Well, I believe similar to what Greg said that the image definitely starts with the city council and we are ambassadors to not only our citizens but also to other cities. Um, as as um, elected officials, we should feel honored that we were chosen and we should live up to that honor every day. And by being negative in any way, shape, or form, that is not honoring your commitment. The best thing we can do is be positive, interact with our community, interact with other communities, and do the best that we can. Thank you. And number six, for years Montrose has had a negative image. What will you do to change that image? Well, both Melissa and Greg hit on the right spot. It's going to start with council. <coughs> a change of council with a change of attitude is going to start things promoting your city in a positive light, um, utilizing the things that you have. We have a, a great newspaper reporter that shows up at every council meeting. I'm sure that he would be more than happy to write positive and wonderful things in the newspaper about the city to help us promote it. It's free advertising. We have a great city web page. We have a Facebook page that's Community of Montreal. Those things should be utilized. The things that should be on there there um, are positive and happy things. It shouldn't be you know, I got an issue with my neighbor's dog, or 
you know, about the speeding down your street. It should be, my next door neighbor made dinner and brought it over to me because I've been sick. Those are the things that should be on there. That's going to change everybody's attitude and everyone's perception. They're going to want to live here. It's like, my gosh, everybody's helping each other out. They all like each other. Thank you. And the last question? <laughs> All right, the question is, um, why do you want to be elected and what changes do you have in mind for Montrose? And for the sake of time, um, we will set the time limit at one minute max per response. So the first one, number three, why do you want to be elected and what changes do you have in mind for Montrose? Well, I'd like to see Montrose back on the move and put our maintenance department, keep them up and going get their shed heated down there so we can defrost the trucks when the winter and the snow blows so our trucks ain't all rust, rusting apart and falling apart so we got less maintenance and low cost on our equipment. Thank you. Number two, why do you want to be elected and what changes do you have in mind for Montrose? Well, I think that we can bring about a positive change, not only in the council, but also in the, in the city staff as well, that will reflect well, not only upon us as a city entirely, but also I think it's important that, that we give back. Um, Montrose has given me a lot since I've been here. It's a place where I raise my family, and it's a place that I call home, and I, I truly think of it as a community. And I think that we can come together better as a community when we work together on the, both the council and at the city level to bring about those positive things that will bring us to a better place in Montrose. Um, I really believe that we need a new direction in our council and we need to have greater oversight on, on our city administration and how those things function together so that they become a cohesive element that works for the better of Montrose and, and not so much like negativity. Thank you. And number one, why do you want to be elected and what changes do you have in mind for Montrose? Well, as I had stated, I've always really enjoyed politics and like the idea of helping out the community. And part of the reason I want to be council is because I, I'm naturally drawn to leadership roles and I want to step into a leadership role and help the community expand, whether it be businesses or houses or parks, in whatever way that I can help. And I just want to help the community and, and be proud of serving the community that I grew up in. Thank you. Number four, why do you want to be elected and what changes do you have in mind for Montrose? I look forward to bringing a positive and thoughtful approach to city council meetings. I really want to be involved in the community. I want to be involved in the process of bringing new businesses and new amenities to our town, um, things that the residents can enjoy, things that people can take their family out to, bring their children out to play. Um, I really feel like if I'm elected, I can bring some of those ideas to the city council, be part of a group and have conversations um, within the city council and express my opinions to get those ideas out um, into the community. I really want to bring improved communication with the residents. I feel um, that I've heard along the way that there's not a lot of opportunity to really know what's happening. A lot of people see the Facebook and Twitter logos on the city sign, but they don't even know if they're still really active. Thank you, John. Number seven, why do you want to be elected and what <coughs> changes do you have in mind for Montrose? Um. The changes that I have are just to continue to do all the volunteering that I'm doing, um, to bring the community together, to help every 